Good evening and welcome to the shop here in Canterbury, New Hampshire. Come right in. Nice of you to come in the back door. Have a nice seat. I see you're already comfortable, so that's good. Well, we're going to get started tonight. We've got a special topic. We're going to talk about customizing and making beautiful pulls for your furniture, for a drawer or a door. Um, and I'll get into that topic a little bit more in just a second. But I do want to say thank you for being here. And if you enjoy this content, please consider subscribing. We'd love to have you notified every time we post a video. That's the, uh, all there is to the commitment. And the thumbs up and ring the bell and all that stuff. And if you want to know more about what, we're going on, what we have going on here, go to epicwoodworking.com and you'll find out about all our courses and insider stuff and all that. So let's get started. Hey, it's great to have you here. And if you were here last week, you may have seen me do the sunburst in the zebra wood. And this is the actual one that we did. And I glued it down on a top. I actually followed through. I had it around for a few days. <laughs> and I said, I'm going to put that down. But one thing I want to show you that I did a little, I went the extra mile and put the vertical grain around the edge rather than running it horizontally. In that way, once I get this trimmed and all cleaned up, it'll give the illusion of the grain kind of spilling over. And it kind of sets it off nicely. I did actually show that technique in the previous course that we just finished on the contemporary round table. So if you miss that, it's still available on video and you could check it out. I'm going to set this aside. All right, so let's get started. I shared this book once before. We, we talked about books and influential books um, in, wood, in the woodworking world. And when we were, the camera lady and I, we're not doing the camera lady thing. <laughs> we were living in Lexington, Massachusetts. We were resident managers at historic Buckman Tavern. If you're familiar with Lexington, that's the kind of like the, uh, what would you call that place? It was sort of like a, not a bed and breakfast. I guess it was like an old time bed and breakfast because you could stay there and get lodging, but you could also eat. And there was a tap room where they served the current uh, beer of the day. But um, another <laughs> lager. Yeah. But um, it was a great time. We were there for four years. And I used to enjoy going across the street to the Lexington Library. And I got really interested in pursuing more in depth with woodworking and seeing what was out there for books. And believe it or not, there were not a lot. This was the late 80s. And so on the shelf, there were only a few books about woodworking. And this happened to be one of them, a cabinet maker's notebook. I had no idea what I was opening up when I opened this up. Because this book, if you haven't read it yet, you're probably already into woodworking if you're watching this. But it, it kind of romances you into the, all the kind of subtleties and it is it's like the romance of woodworking. And that is what people get caught up a lot in. And I, I certainly did. And I still I am, really. But I've also, I know the reality, too. I know the reality of being married to it. <laughs> Me, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. No, it's like, it, there's a little difference, right? So, um, but... This guy, James Krenoff, he writes so beautifully and, you know, almost spiritually about the craft of woodworking. And there's such beautiful images in here. And the reason I'm showing it you in particular is because of the cover photo. It's this little box. But it, look at how every, everything is just so warm. And he's got these soft radius corners but the beautiful dovetails and a nice uh, open-ended tenon here frame on the top of this box. But he's also got this little handle, 
a knob or a pull actually um, to lift this lid. Um, so it's so beautifully just crafted so your finger will fit under there. You can almost see like the subtlety of the oils of the fingers that have lifted it and enjoyed that box. And that image, it's just captivating, you know, and you, it, it's almost inviting. You wish you could just flip that open and look inside. And he's got a number of things in here about just, I'll, ch I'll show you in a second the things about knobs. But one thing I want you to notice, and it kind of blows my mind, is the car photo actually he has right on the front page, this master craftsman. There's a mistake. Can you see that? You, is Let's this see. reflecting? I'm going to highlight his mistake. No, I just want to say because... <laughs> Wait, it is a little gloss. How human we all are. You know, is that, how about that? Oh, hold it right there. Okay. So come right in. Look at the knife lines right here. Actually, it's a marking gauge line when you lay out the dovetails. There's a double line. They're like a 16th inch apart. There's no reason for that other than setting it off the first time. So <laughs> it's just funny to me, like even a great master like this has his moments, right? And, but then doesn't care. I, I'm sure most people would ever, never even notice that. But here's the box actually in size. That's the actual size of it. So you can see the little key. Just a little keepsake box. But pretty sweet, right? I, I've noted a couple other pages in here where you can see he was famous for his cabinets. And um, let's see. I'm going to show you the one that has the most options. Okay. So this, this page shows you some of his cabinet pulls. And like over here, he's got these little uh, subtle radius fronts. And then there's a ridge on the top and I'm sure the bottom and on the sides. So your fingers will catch on there nicely. And here it is actually on the front of the case. And then he's got this style where you have like a dowel through two pieces mounted into the door so you get more of this almost like an Asian pull there and but the ones that I think are the nicest are the ones that he he sculpts a little bit so here's a little thing where he writes in that romantic language about just the directness and the utility of using a knife so he's using a knife to just peel and in detail one of his pulls to go on some kind of cabinet. And there's a nice little write up there. I almost wanted to read it to you, but when I, you can you can check out the book. You can get this you can get this on uh, used books, you know, go to eBay or whatever and uh, I'm sure you'll find it. A cabinet maker's notebook by James Cranoff. That's not the library book, by the way. You bought it, right? Right. <laughs> Jeez. Somebody said, wow, imagine the charges on that, the library charges. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't take that buck. <laughs> this, uh, but <laughs> there probably is one in our book case someplace that we have taken. Uh, I don't think so. Not from there, <laughs> but maybe somewhere. You but have a favorite in that book, Stephen's asking? Favorite piece? A favorite piece? Mm -hmm. um, not really. It doesn't, uh, just the warmth and the... You'll, if you flip through it, like, well, let me just finish what I'm saying here. Just the warmth and the detail of all the, it's just really, it's, the best word I can think of is warmth, because it's inviting. It makes you, you almost want to reach out and just feel the edges and, you know, it's, it's interactive furniture. This, this was another little style of a pull where it's inset so you've got kind of like a hollow with the pull in there vertically and I've seen that that's a pretty effective way of mounting a pull you can take it out uh, your fingers on it vertically but he's done a little slick thing here where he's got the the um, the reveal or the, the groove of the space between the drawers is so thin that it's almost hard to tell that that's actually a separation of two drawers and you can see them opened up here so it actually covers two drawers 
I've seen this used really effectively in other cases where it was a carved kind of dished out round and then a round knob set in there. So it's almost like the knob is set into a hollow and it's kind of a different effect. And let's see. That's a good question, do I think. Just look at, I mean, just look at that hanging shelf, you know. That would be a nice one to emulate and make a, a similar shelf. I mean, do you guys think even people even want shelves like that anymore? Like the little drawer? But they're sweet. They're, this would be a good project, I think. And, you know, we don't have to do it exactly like that, but we could make our pull different. But there's a simplicity and elegance to a little hanging shelf like that. Um, he was known for using knife hinges, so they kind of disappeared. But look at that. I love the detail of that. The shadows here. The end grain of this little pull. You just want to reach in and pull that open. And this is one of his little clever catches that he made. I think there's a little spring in there. So when the door, door closes, it just bumps and holds it, you know, invisibly without like a magnet. Here's one of the clean cupboard fronts and the knife hinges used, how they, uh, they almost disappear. This was actually the inspiration. This book and his, his mode of making was the inf inspiration for one of the, I think it was the second episode, if you saw the uh, classic woodworking series, the second episode with the Bowfront ash cabinet. It was really kind of a homo homage, a homage. <laughs> well, how do you say that? Homage? Is it not, homage? I'm not sure what you're trying to say. I'm not sure. Yeah, that word is a homage to James Cranoff, that, to make that bow front cabinet. But tonight, what I've been, I've got these kind of pulls on my mind because we're in the middle of, actually, uh, we've had two sessions of a writing desk course where we've got these two narrow uh, pencil drawers, or you could put your writing paper or whatever. It's a nice little drawers. And it gives the perfect opportunity to create an original pull for yourself. So it's kind of like you got a clean slate, and it's all what you want to do. Now, a lot of the period furniture that was beautifully handmade, they would, they would use like more ornate brass poles. Like this is a beautiful swan pole. If you've been around, you may recognize that from the walnut chest of drawers we finished. And that was a classic um, style in the Queen Anne into Chippendale period. Um, and then this is, a, this is actually charred. This is brass, but it came off of a, a, a chest of drawers that was in a fire. And I've got the whole box of all the poles you know, it's good to have things like that. <laughs> so glad we have those. <laughs> the reason is they're, <laughs> they are original to an empire piece. So that would put it, you know, in the late 1800s, you know. But this was the style of pull they had a lot. So it was almost like a small doorknob on the piece. What? Burned is the style? Or, or would you clean them? <laughs> no, round. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like a mini doorknob. No, I should polish that off. And Charred. You'll see. Pay extra you'll see. for the char. I, <laughs> I made a really good investment saving that. And then you have these modern pulls. Oh, gosh. Like this nickel-plated, glossy nickel-plated. And this, um, I actually, I had a client. I did a, made a bow front chest out of um, birch, red birch. And it was... I have to say myself, it was beautiful. beautiful. It was one of the nicest pieces. I'm, I'm going to definitely share with you at some point a red birch piece, and maybe even that bow front, because it was so sweet. And they specified they wanted this kind of pull, and it almost killed me to put them on there, because I was thinking, you know, something more traditional, because it was a little bit traditional with a federal leg. But, you know, when I got them on there, I was like, those actually looked pretty nice, didn't they? 
You saw that, right? Is that the, the um, dentist? Cross? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it was beautiful. Yeah, so I had, you know, they were horizontal lines like this. So there you start thinking about what kind of shape will be appealing and complementary to this piece. Do I want something that contrasts a little for some pop, or do I want something that feels like it kind of grew into this piece, like it belongs, you know, in a linear sense? Um, so I'm going to set these aside and just show you a couple. I just just to note that. The most recent uh, issue of Fine Woodworking Magazine, there's actually an article on uh, page 64 of a contemporary door and drawer pulls. And they show how to make this, this style pull here. It's mitered. There's a lot, a lot of little jigging up to it, you know, because you got these smaller pieces. And they're using the toggle clamps for safety, good practice. But it makes a nice little pull, and uh, if you wanted a linear kind of squarish one like that, that would be a, a nice one to make. It looks, it reminds me of like a um, of the mid-century modern style, you know, that Scandinavian look. But I like to put a little more subtlety, curves, or facets in the pulls. And what I want to point out is this this one back here. On, you may have noticed these behind me, but these are made of chestnut. Actually, oh, that's got a little glue on it. But wormy chestnut. <laughs> that's <laughs> what kitchen, happens. Kitchen cabinet. Please. Yeah, exactly. So the drawer front's a walnut, but the <laughs> handles I made out of some small chunks of wormy chestnut I had. And you would think they're walnut the way they ended up blending in, but they're not. And um, I wanted something that felt good to pull, but... It almost had that Cronovian warmth and blended in nice. It looked like it belonged in a wood shop, but wasn't going to kill me to make it. So that, this is actually what it is. And I'm going to show you this, how, to, how I made something like this. And I want you to just think of the process of my making this as a jumping off point. Maybe it'll trigger some ideas for you, but you can use this kind of approach to designing and making your own. But it, I also wanted to point out before doing that, this, the classic shaker uh, knobs. Like this is the shaker knob uh, pattern that I have on the uh, shaker blanket chest that we'll be doing next month. Um, if you want to be part of that course. Not blanket chest, you mean. I'm sorry, chest, chest of drawers. Yeah. yeah. The shaker chest of drawers course uh, that we're starting next month. You can check that out on our website. Um, and then there's a little smaller version. I was trying to think when I did that one. And then this is close. This wasn't the final version, but this is close to the final version of the pull that I made on my ash cabinet that was on that classic woodworking program that I told you that was Cronovian. I mean, doesn't that kind of look like it belongs almost in his book, you know. So it's got the curvature, so it's inviting for the pull, but it has a lot of warmth and subtle curves and this faceting. It's just sweet. I love these little details. Like, because when, when you think about it, that knob or that, that pull is the touch point, usually, of most pieces. Like a, a cabinet on the wall. People don't go up and touch the whole thing. The, the interacting point is that pull, even in a chest or a chest of drawers. A writing desk, yes, the surface, the only other time you're interacting is when you're reaching and you get this tactile interaction with the pull. And that's actually an opportunity for you and me as makers and to, to express something, make people want to feel something, like you spent... You went the extra mile. You spent some extra time. There's a lot of love and care went into this, and it's really noticeable by the the feel and the detail and the just the thought outness of that pull. So make it a good experience. You know, it, every time 
It still happen when you make your own piece of furniture too. Like every time you use it, there's like this positive feedback. And uh, why not? It's, <laughs> it's great too, because especially if you pass these things down to your children or grandchildren or whatever, they'll know, I mean, if it has some character and it's got even leave, leave a little faceting on there that they're not all exactly the same. That was hand made and I spent a lot of time shaping that. So that's what I get into about making a nice pole and that's certainly the, the feeling I get when I see the Cranoff book. So I want to start out by just showing you the process of making my, I don't, these are pretty, these are nice, but I didn't kill myself designing them. But I do like it because it's got a good strong pull and these drawers are on, you know, metal glides, but they, these had to be pretty strong. And I've, I've got them, they start out with an inch and a quarter square piece of stock. So I'm going to make one out of this stock right here. It's an inch and a quarter square and it's four and five eighths inches long. That's what we started with and this is what we finish with. All right, so if you notice, we've got obviously the profile. It's got these curving sides and then this inner part comes up and arches. And then under here, it's kind of been whittled and rounded. So it's nice. It's got a nice soft kind of pull in there. And then if you look at it from the top view, you can see it's actually got that kind of sweeping out to the full and then it comes in and you have a narrower pull here. Now you could change this. This could be miniaturized to fit on a smaller drawer. I mean, that little area right across there, that could be as small as a quarter inch if you wanted, or five sixteenths, you know, and on a more delicate drawer pull. So this is, uh, this is what we're going to go with. So when I, when I make something like that, I usually will make a quick pattern on just some manila file folder or some kind of more rigid paper stock. And I'm going to get my square. And I made a, um, a mark over here. Let's see. I'm going to just get it to an inch and a quarter. There we go. And I'll make a, a cut here. Right. Now, I made a few little guidelines. I just got to figure out what they are. <laughs> okay, so I came in. My overall four and five eighths is right here. So that's the, the end. Let me just bring that up here. And there we go. And now coming in to the top of this arch measures right about seven eighths of an inch. So I could do that on both ends, but I really only need to do it on one end and I'll show you why in a second. And then down here, I'm coming in an inch. So I've got a mark there. And then this arch, it moves over about a quarter of an inch from this point over. So that's in like an inch and a quarter. Yeah, and that's what I've got right there. Okay. Now the, um, the width of this rail right here is 9 sixteenths. So that's what I'll go with. It's close. Yeah, that's it there. And I'm going to just draw that across. Just eyeball it here. Parallel with my other line. There you go. Okay. Now I'm just going to freehand this because it's not super worrisome here. I'm just, I just want a nice curve that comes right into my one inch point. I, might, I mean my f seven eighths point there. If you wanted to recreate this. And then I'm coming from the seven eighths. I'm just going to sweep up to that point. Okay. Now I'm going to take my knife, my knif, and I'm going to slice it 
here we go. I'll just make a, let's see, I don't want to cut it too far. Oops. What? Just thinking how I don't want my doctor who's holding a scalpel to say, oops. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's okay here, but. Okay, and then I'm just going to use my scalpel to make the incision and sweep the curve. You know, this ha it doesn't, you don't have to worry too much if it's perfection, obviously. But that gets our little pattern right there. Now I could mark it and cut it on the other end, but I can just fold it over and my pencil make the mirror image of what I just did. And then, oh, look at that. My knife cut was perfectly placed. I didn't know where to start it. That's why I said, oops. <laughs> but look, ma'am, your incision got in the perfect spot. Phew. <laughs> and I can come down. Boom. I do that for my sister, Mommy. She's like me like that. So there you go. Perfect profile, right chair. All right. So now that I've got that, I can draw it onto my piece. Now I can decide, do I want that linear grain on the face? Yes, I do. Or the plain sawn, you know, doesn't really matter that much, but I think the linear is going to look better going down the side or the, it's linear meaning quarter sawn-ish. Yeah, that is pretty quarter sawn. So let's pop it on there, and we'll go ahead and trace it out. I'll use a pen here. And then get the other side. Sorry. I went over to Goose Bay, uh, it was yesterday, right? Yeah, to pick up some... Uh, maple for the top of that desk that we're doing the course on and man they had some amazing uh big leaf quilted maple so i'm going to be showing that and as well as um some flame birch for one of the other tops but so i'm excited to share that but here you go so now i want to cut away these areas obviously and then we'll come back here and we'll move to our other shape so we do them in sequence one on the side one vertically all right let's go right over to the big bandsaw over here i mean that little bandsaw <laughs> it's i've got my 3 8 blade on there with six teeth per inch and that'll do the trick turn on the air Right. There we go. Now, 
watch out for the bench. We're going to come over here. Gets me every time. I'm just going to do on this wide belt sander here, this horizontal belt. This makes it really easy to sand an outside uh, convex curve like this. We don't have to be too fancy, so I'm just going to roll it. That's it. Next one. All right. So that was easy. So if I was making a series of them, I would have just marked out all of them and then come back. Now I've got it like this. And you know, you could stop right here, right? And have a clunky <laughs> looking pull. I mean, that's pretty heavy. That just wouldn't do it. So we're gonna go a little further here and I'm gonna make that center rail I'll start out making it 5 8 I think that's what I got here it's a little less than 5 8 so let's just make a mark on here I'll find the center line here's my center line and I'll come out 5 16 right there and I'm just gonna use my finger as a stop Let's get the pen so you can see it better. And make a straight line like that. Then I'm going to hold my fence on my square there, my human square, and make another line like that. Okay, so that gives us our 5 eighths right in the middle there. So I'll probably end up taking that line anyway. But then we want to get that sweep on the end. So to get that, I'm going to use this little extra piece of paper here. Let's just square this end off. I made a little longer inch and a quarter strip. Okay, and let's just take it on this one. I'm going to bend it right up over that curve we've got there. and Make a little crease right at the top. So right there. where we are let's get our square back here all right so I'm right there let's I'm gonna establish that line across the top of this I mean you could set up your square to do it but it's kind of fun and fast to just do it with your finger like that all right now I want to make that sweeping shape like this and it's actually pretty it's it's not a much of a curve it's a little bit more on the side but we're going to get that curve more on the sanding drum in a second. So I'm just going to come right from here and, again, just freehand a line right in here and come right up to my point. And I'll do the same over here. Let me turn it around. And I'll sweep out to the point. Oh, and then I'll take my knife. Let's just make it. I guess I'll just start right here. And then the other side. Nice. All right, so we can pull this back and take it off. And now we've got our template for our piece. So I'm going to just hold that snug there and get it out to the corner at the bottom. That looks pretty good. And I'll use my pen again. Other side. And then the other end. some questions about your uh, dust collection system so maybe you can address yeah. that. 
don't you use? I have a cyclone uh, downstairs. It's an Oneida cyclone, and it it all the pipes run along the ceiling downstairs, and then they come up. So it's kind of nice not to have it in sight, but uh, it's um, it's nice. I think it's it was a five horse, so it, it pulls a lot of air. But yeah, I like it a lot. It it really clears the air around here. Um, anyway, we have a large space, so yeah. someone else might not need it to be as powerful. No, the the Oneida, the two to three horsepower, those move a lot of air. And that's I would have probably gone with the three, but um, they had a deal on the five at the time. This was twenty years ago, so almost. Anyway, look, we've now got it to shape it. You don't have to fuss and be so perfect about it, but that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to come back to the bandsaw, and now I'm holding it this way. I'm going to raise the fence a little bit, I mean the guide, so I can see. i got to see down over that curve, and I'm just going to leave the pen mark. After all that talk about the dust collector, I forgot to turn it on. But um, so now we've got this radius here, and I want to sand that up. And that, as you may have seen me use before, I've got a three-inch solid kind of drum that I mount into the drill press. I forgot to tell you we've got to go over there. Yeah, you can zoom right from here. I think won't take long. Okay. So I'm over here. So I've got that drum fixed in the drill press. And I built this little riser block. And I sawed around it so I could have free access to this whole thing. But I just need this much here. So I'm going to sight it here and just let it create and smooth that bandsaw mark. And it also makes the radius like sort of like it's a little, it's almost exactly the radius you want. Just getting rid of the bandsaw marks. other side. That's it. Look how sweet that. Nice and clean. Let's take it back to the bench. We've got a little more to do on it. For this next little step, I'm going to use the Cronovian knife. So this is actually a nice little carving knife um, that 
um, I've seen these, I got it when I was thinking of doing um, the caricature carving, because not. I don't really have time to do it, but I met some people who were doing an amazing job, and it was so inspiring. It's kind of like you got to have a little life outside of the shop. <laughs> it's like, what am I going to do, sit in the house and whittle? Anyway, um, I got to got to have other hobbies. So I'm cutting into the corner, and then I'm going to cut in this way. I, you know, I could just, if I had a flap sander, I would, like a narrow one, you could do this on that and just round this off. But this is uh, another way of introducing a little hand tool here. So we're just cutting in. This is technically like a stop cut. So the fibers of wood are running this way, like the tubes. And now I'm going to come in from the side. And with those stop cuts, it'll release the fibers at the end. So I'll make, I make those cuts first. And it's almost like you're peeling a potato. Not bad. Kind Tom of fun. Ron's ask, Ron is asking, would an oscillator drum sander do the same thing as what you just did over? Yeah, absolutely, yep. That would be fine. In fact, I would, I have a little one, but it's kind of noisy. It's old and it's cheap. So, um, but that's one of those things that I would like to get used sometime. Like a nice, like a, a good chunky one, you know. It's good to have them in the shop because you can do little things like that easily. So, I would go and round this off just quickly like that. And it kind of, you, you can leave some texture there. A little if, Tom Sawyer. If you want people to <laughs> feel. <laughs> but this is not like as fancy as some others. But it's kind of nice. If you do have a, a knife, you could detail it and put little facets on there, you know, and a la James Krenhoff. Okay. I could put a little facet here if I wanted just like that little birdie right there I, you might have said this Tom but I'm going to ask you um, when you're paring away on the bandsaw what tooth count were you using I had a six tooth per inch three eighth inch band okay. so it leaves a pretty smooth surface um, I just keep that on my smaller saw most of the time All right, so that's good. Now, I want to smooth that out a little bit more. So I've got my wood screw in here. What was I using that for? And oh, I know. So I'm going to just, I've got it in my vise, and it acts as a, a second kind of clamp. It gets it up in the air, so I'm not down here in my vise. I've got a little block over here that's the same thickness to keep the vise from racking and uh, works nicely like that. Okay, now I can just come in here and use my rasp and files. I'll just do this quick. You can see, I won't go too crazy here. What? Clever setups. Yeah. Okay, I get a really light bite on it here. And we'll use the coarse. Now I'm on the, f the little fine file. Hey, while you're doing this, that pole that you had shown earlier. Which one? The, the brown one? the one that you had on the walnut chest. Yeah. Ed was asking, uh, the, yeah, the pole used on the walnut piece, where would you get that, a source for that? Oh, Horton Brasses. Horton Brasses in uh, Connecticut. They're excellent. They, um, they make a lot of period poles. They have a lot more contemporary now, too. Like, when I first started using them, like, Pug used to always order from them because they, they were really good for period furniture. Uh, reproductions 
And um, that was what he did. And anyway, they, they have now, they have all kinds of like craftsman style and some contemporary type pulls that you can get. Even, you can even get like things nickel plated there. And, but, so check them out, they're, they're good. And I say that because they're not a sponsor obviously, but they're, they've been really, um, really a good company to me as long, I've, and I've been using them for 30 years. So they're very friendly and they ship right out, all that. Okay, so I would have filed the sides a little bit too there, but there you would have it. Then I would so soften a lot of these edges a little bit. You know, give it a final touch up, like all those little surfaces. And just for fun, we'll splash on a little bit of, I had some orange shellac mixed up. Normally I would put maybe clear or oil in there, but let's go with orange. Let's see what she looks like. What? <laughs> what? The bottles just are so funny. The bottle? Super fine orange shellac. This is a three pound cut. I usually thin it out more, but um, this is just for this little thing, so. Uh, Stuart's asking, are there four sides on that file? Uh, yes, Stuart, there are. On one end, I have a flat, and that's rough, more coarse file. On, on the other side, it's radius or rounded. So it's coarse at this end, and then it's finer on that end. So, yeah, those are nice. We, we I should have said we would link, yeah. Yeah, we can link it to that, Stuart. We'll put a link on there for that. Joseph is asking, is asking if Mr. Moore is still around. No, sorry. Passed away in 2003, so um, he was 86 at the time. We sure enjoyed him. Yeah, he was a good man. As long as we knew him. Mike's asking, would you use a threaded insert in the handle to take a machine screw? Oh, good question, insert? Mike. Yeah, I, um, I wanted to mention that. Um, so something like this, what I ended up doing was locating, let's see, I think I have one. Yeah, here's one. So I decided I spaced them out. I wanted to get that hole into the meat of the handle. So you want to set it in where you've got good purchase there. And then I, I think these are like three and three eighths apart. And then I pre-drilled for them. And then on the drawers I had, I marked out, you know, I'd center my three and three eighths holes wherever I wanted them on the drawer. And I came on the inside and I just ran like, I just had like heavy drywall screws or something, you know, coarse thread that got well into there, like over a half an inch in. Because I pre-drilled them, I'm not worried about it splitting. But that gave a lot of, a lot of heavy coarse thread grabbing in there. And I've never had a problem with these. So that's the method here. But traditionally, I'd rather have some type of tenon on there and... That, that's a good segue into... Also asking, I think, if you would, if it would tolerate a machine screw or a wood screw. Do you need, did you already? Um, if you're going to put an insert in here, I mean, this is kind of small for an insert, but um, if you're going to put an insert, a, a machine screw is good. That's, um, like, these aren't, these are more of a machine screw thread, and that's how these all go in, of course, on a nut. But they, uh, I think just a coarse thread in this case, but if you can put an insert in, it's large enough to pull, that's a, a nicer way to go about it because I think you'd get a, a strong, really strong grab there with the insert. All right, so I didn't even show it to you, but there you have it. Nice little pull, pretty quick and easy, and it's nice and Feels good, looks clean and contemporary and slick, like something you'd buy, right? Almost. And it was that easy just to knock out and make one of those. 
So that's exactly what we've got back here, but this one in cherry. And that would darken up over time. So that's one idea, you know. So if you think about your pull in that two dimensions, where you're on the side view and then the top view. But the other thing I always like to think about is the tactile experience, you know. So when you come in, you grab it. Is there kind of like a comfort spot for your thumb and, and forefinger or whatever, middle finger underneath that holds it? You know, if it's especially a small, delicate pull. I called my friend uh, Terry Moore earlier today. I was thumbing through the Furniture Masters books. Every year we would make a catalog like this. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Furniture Masters, it's a group of makers here, mostly in New Hampshire, but in New England. Um, and it's, you can see the website online. It's furnituremasters.org. It's a group of about 20, 25 makers who are professional furniture makers for many years. Some really great makers in there. Professional artists, yeah. Yeah, and so if you want to, you can go on, on the web page and uh, check out, you can click on all the different makers. But if you go and check out Terry Moore stuff, you'll probably see a desk like this. And I thought of him, I was flipping through, and I go, wow, that's a good example of a nice application of a custom pull. And Terry was telling me he was influenced by Edward Barnsley. Um, I hope I don't screw this up, but he was over in England, I believe, an English maker. And, uh, or maybe he was Welsh, like Terry. <laughs> but um, I know Terry's son, what, did I move it? Uh -huh. I know Terry's son, Tom, watches sometimes, so hey, Tom. <laughs> anyway, uh, this, these poles are like little half rounds, and he makes them out of curly maple. But that desk, that is rosewood veneer. Just outstanding. And these light kind of, uh, they're also maple lines. In, so you have this kind of offset, I mean, contrast with the lines being bright around that desk. I don't think this is the desk. This might be the desk, that's, but there's one in the Curry Museum of Art here in Manchester. It's the largest art museum in New Hampshire. And Terry's got a desk in there, as do a number of other furniture masters. You know, David Lamb, um, who else? Uh, I think Ed Ted Blatchley does. And then Jerry Osgood. So. Someday it could be you. <laughs> but so anyway, I called Terry. I said, hey, as I re just refresh my memory on those, um, how did you make those? Like, aren't, are they little semicircular? And he said, yes, they are. And, and he went through really nicely. And he told me the process of how he made them. And I'm just going to give you the visual of how something like this is made. Because you want a lot of these type pulls there. They're, they have an integrated tenon on there. So you want to make a slot into the drawer front and glue in the tenon. Most times, a drawer is not a hard enough pull where you need to go through with the tenon and wedge from the back. But you can do it for fun, right? <laughs> you want. But uh, a good fitting tenon glued in is going to give you lots of longevity. But in this case, uh, he said he, he cut stock, here I'll show you, like this, something like this. And I, I made this, I don't know if this is the right thickness, but I'm about five-eighths thick on these. And it's two inches wide. And I just made a tenon on the end on the table saw. Just a quick tenon of about, you can make it a quarter inch. This one's five sixteenths. And then the tenon is only about a little over half inch long. So I cut the shoulders and all that. Then I would take this piece and cut it off. Well, let me just show you. I won't make the whole thing, but I'll give you an idea of how it's cut off. So the overall length, it's going to be semicircular, so it needs to be more than an inch because we're two inch wide here. I'll just go a little longer there. And I'm just going to use the bandsaw and rough this off. Here we go. Okay. 
So if you're doing a bunch of them, you could do these consecutively. You just, you'd make a clean cut on a crosscut saw and then go back to your tenon setup and cut another tenon and then go ahead and trim it off and you just keep going and getting these small pulls. And then to make this pull, you need a little demi-loon curve. And this is a nice, sweet, kind of simple um, geometric shape. So you can make a round like that. And then that's bandsawn right off. So if you go, uh, so then once that's bandsawn, then you sand it up. But it still would look too thick. So Terry added some nice details. He sloped the top down. And then I said, yeah, don't, I remember using that. And I thought I remembered something underneath. And he said, yeah, I take a gouge and I dish it out underneath. So your finger will feel like it has a good landing spot. So I, I played around with this a little earlier to try to reproduce. And if Terry sees this, I hope I didn't screw it up. But uh, it slopes down at about an angle like that. So you end up with a nice kind of lean profile in the front. So that thins it up. You can imagine this now on the drawer front. It looks pretty elegant now. You got that slope. And if that, that has nice curl in it right there too, but it's not really showing great here. And then underneath, I took a little gouge to it and sanded it. So it's got that nice pull. So there you have it. A close rendition of a Terry How Moore pull. Gouge at the bottom. Um, with a gouge. <laughs> I use this gouge right here. I've got a, a, a set of these, and I just came in. I, I'm not going to demonstrate this whole one but in the interest of time, but I wanted you to see that. Um, plus, it's kind of Terry's thing. But if you're ever at the Kerry Museum of Art in Manchester, look for that desk. And maybe when no one's looking, you can just feel the pull <laughs> and just see the true the master's. Out. On you for suggesting this. <laughs> Alarms will go off, I'm sure. <laughs> so then um, this, this one I mentioned earlier is made in a similar way. So the one that I, I made on that little cabinet, I did the same thing. I had a longer stick, you know, something like this or longer, and I make the tenons on each end. You could do it that way. And then you chop it off to the length you need, and then I start shaping it from there. So I went from this to this. I rounded the sides. So now I've got just that profile. And then I laid it down on this angle and made some nice cuts on the side, and then radius the top and added this sweet facet all around, a la James Krenoff. And that's a sweet, nice tactile pull. Now, this is the idea that I wanted to incorporate in our contemporary desk, our modern writing desk, the project that we just have two sessions done. So I designed a special pull for that course because here's how, the, here's how that desk looks. So that's just kind of the bones of the front of it. So we've got these open spaces here. And this is going to be a drawer front and a drawer front. So right in here, we got this really low profile. And it was like, what would be nice in there? Well, it felt like a horizontal linear pull. Um, something in the, in the line of like Terry's half moon pull there. But I wanted to incorporate more of that shape of the Krenov, like that style there. And that pull feel, felt like it was too not wide enough and stuck out a little too far for this table. I, want, I wanted it to be set back a little more. So the pull we're going to make in the course is actually this one. It's got that low profile, but it's wider. It's only actually an inch and three quarters wide, but it's got some sweet shaping. Whoops. And when that gets into the front, the drawer front will be light. It'll be the same material as the top. It's going to be like a, that big leaf maple or um, 
or the birch, the flame birch. And then this walnut pull is going to go in here. And because it's in grain, it's going to look quite dark. So it'll be set off and distinguished from the surrounding walnut, which is all side grain. You get that beautiful golden color. So we'll still have walnut, but it's going to almost look like an exotic piece of wood there. And then those, those shapes will make it really sweet. And I like how it's more rectangular in length and in this shape. So I actually, for those, to see how this one is actually made, though, you'll have to be part of the course. And it's not too late. We're going to, this I won't be making until later in the course, but we've already done two sessions, but um, they're on video. So if you want to join now, it's not too late. And you can go, go ahead back and watch that, those videos. We've just gotten through some of the joinery. And this is the actual full-size drawing for that course. So this is what, this is how the pole is going to look. On, so you can see this, the proportions of it on the drawing feel good. You know, they're not overwhelming on that face. And then down here, I have the top view of the drawer. So that's that pull we just looked at, uh, like right here. So there it is. It's going to sit right there. And then this is the side view. So you can see all that nice sculpting. So all the information is on here for you to perfectly recreate that pull. Or you can put your own little spin on it. You know, you can have some fun. Look around. Check out Edward Barnsley's stuff. Look up James Cranoff. Just kind of let it soak in. And maybe you'll do your own little version of a pull. And, uh, but if you are interested, I hope you can join us for that class because this is one that's exciting me because it's the first project that I feel the end result will be Furniture Masters exhibit worthy. So it's going to be uh, hopefully a piece like that. And it's the first time we've shared something like that. Not that the other things aren't nice, but I was designing for a lot of beginner to intermediate pieces as we went along. And the way this is a strong intermediate, I would say, piece because of some of the things involved. But if you've got some experience, this would, the way we walk through it, you would absolutely be right on board with us and have no problem making it. So, all right. Well, I hope that inspired you to make some of your own custom pulls and have that little caring, loving expression on your work that people can enjoy for generations to come and every time they visit the museum. Sounds awesome. <laughs> you are reading. What, are there any other questions? Uh, no, uh, well, they're asking about classes. Ron's asking about classes. Oh, classes well, here? Responding, yep, to that. Oh, okay. We're doing some different things this year, so hang on. Yeah, we've got kind of a full plate with a lot of this stuff going on. But this... Uh, yeah, Garrett Hack also in the Furniture Masters. A lot of you probably know his name as well. Yeah, Garrett's in there. Ted, Tim Coleman's in there. David Lamb. Like Ted Blatchley. Great names. Yeah, there's so many really gifted makers. Um, Jeff Roberts. Some of you know him. He does a lot of great traditional work. Um, but go on online, you'll really enjoy it. I mean, just scan the different choices that they made for pulls. You know, some of them, like John Cameron, he makes his own uh, silver pulls and he engraves them. Like, he's, he's into metal work as well. So unbelievably detailed, exquisite um, silver pulls that he, he puts on. Sometimes they're bronze or brass, I don't know, just and they're engraved beautifully. But so you can go that way too, if you would like. So yeah. all right. Well thank you again for hanging out tonight in the shop for this little bit of time. I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you'll take a plunge at making these kind of details and adding them to your works of art. So hey remember if you like this content please consider subscribing. We'd love to have you know every time we send out a new video. And if you want to go deeper with us, 
check out the website at epicwoodworking.com. Yeah, hit that thumbs up if you would. That'd be great. And share with your friends what you know about Epic Woodworking. That'd be great. Thanks, everybody, for being here. We look forward to seeing you next time right back here in the shop for Shop Night Live! <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Love that. Thanks, guys. See you Thanks. later. Good to see you and be with you guys.